Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day two of the European Employment and Social Rights Forum. For those who are just joining now on day two and perhaps missed day one, my name is Ali Aslan. I'm an international TV presenter and journalist based in Berlin, Germany. I already had the great pleasure of guiding you through day one, and I have the distinct pleasure of doing so again today. Uh, welcome to everyone in here. I know uh, the weather is quite bad here, traffic is bad, but still looking into the audience. Uh, yesterday we had a packed audience and of course a very warm welcome to everybody who's joining us online as well. I don't know if it's in this camera or that camera, but be that as it may. Welcome to you. As a matter of fact, uh, up to 500 people joined us online yesterday. Quite a large uh, number and uh, you know the drill. This is a very uh, interactive format where not just you here in the audience, but everyone who's joining us online can submit questions via the chat and or Slido. So please keep your questions coming. It was great yesterday. We had a very interactive element here throughout the conversation. I hope to have the same again uh, today. Quick reminder, the hashtag still remains EU social forum. Um, today is actually going to be quite a marathon. Yesterday we had a few coffee breaks in between. Today we're starting at 9.30 and we're going to end approximately around 1.30, but uh, virtually no breaks in between. So this is going to be a four-hour marathon. First we're going to start here on stage, on this main stage all together, but then, then we're going to have uh, three breakout sessions uh, divided by three thematic strands. Um, I'll tell you more about it as we go along, but the three workshops, I think you all signed up for them by now. You know which one you will be at. If, if not, refer to the program, and I'm sure we can accommodate you uh, last minute as uh, well. Um, so, so I'm very delighted to uh, kick off uh, today's uh, session, day two, which will be a bit different, as I said, in terms of how it is structured, but very content rich, undoubtedly, nonetheless. And now, without further ado, to kick off uh, day two with opening remarks. It is my great pleasure indeed to welcome back on stage the Director General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome, and here he is already, Jos Korte. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good, mo good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to see you back on the second day of the, uh, of the forum. And I'm glad to see so many people, indeed, who, uh, who, who came in spite of the, of the bad weather and the storm. Um, so, for those of you who missed uh, yesterday, uh, it was a very, very dynamic, full, and I thought also very inspiring day. We heard a lot of ideas, a lot of um, memories also, um, and, uh, and, and a lot of high-level speakers, which I think provide us all with a lot of inspiration for the work uh, that is ahead of us. Uh, we celebrated the fifth anniversary of the Pillar of Social Rights that was declared in uh, Gothenburg uh, now five years ago. Um, looked also back through the speech of Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, how difficult um, the process had actually been. Um, he left us with, uh, I think, three important words. Patience, conviction et détermination. And he basically said that whatever you do on social Europe, it will always be difficult, always an uphill struggle. Nothing happens by itself. Even though, of course, as he also recognized, everybody is in favor of social Europe. Like everybody's also in favor of a fair transition. You don't, need, you don't meet anybody who's against it. But to actually get it done is, is a wholly different ballgame. I thought it was extremely enriching for the debate and a good lesson also uh, for, for, for the future. We also celebrated the European Pact of Skills, the sec its second anniversary, with now 1,000 members and uh, 6 million commitments to upskill and reskill in the labor market. Uh, and that was also, I think, a very good reply to uh, those fears that were expressed that we should be careful that uh, fair transition is not just turning into an interesting topic for a conference, it's not just talking, agreeing with each other and going home, it is also about delivery and implementation on the ground. And I think the Pact of Skills um, 
the Pact for Skills is indeed a, a very, very real commitment of, of businesses and, and social partners. Um, what can I say? Uh, maybe a few more points about yesterday's before I will go to today's proceedings. Overwhelmingly, I think the feeling was that the European Union in itself is quite well placed to ensure a fair transition. Uh, and here, President von der Leyen uh, mem uh, memorized uh, the, uh, the way in which COVID had been overcome with a, a, a large degree of solidarity uh, um, uh, within the European Union. And, and her message was that we need to do the same uh, for the Fed to ensure a fair transition. Nevertheless, of course, the challenge is absolutely uh, gi gigantic. Uh, Mrs. Matsukato said that it was more difficult to ensure a fair transition than to land on the moon. And I think others uh, also um, echoed that same uh, sentiment. And it will certainly not happen by default. The, the transition will not be fair by itself. I think that is also a very strong lesson. It requires action, policy measures, and also policy measures that need to be uh, done in an integrated fashion. You cannot approach it only uh, through technical climate measures, through transport, or through business. You need to ensure that all the different strands of policy making are, uh, are integrated in one package. Uh, our own commissioner was also very firm in his uh, con various contributions to the, um, uh, to the day yesterday, and he said uh, essentially that if the transition is not fair, it will not happen. He said if we, if we lose the support of the population, if we lose the support of society, there will be uh, a lot of trouble and there will be no transition. And he obviously remembered also what happened with the gilet uh, jaune. Um, now, we will have a lot of opportunity today to go much deeper into all these issues, which is good. And also next year, I would like to say that uh, we will have the opportunity in Porto sometime in the month of May to also take stock of progress since the Porto summit in, that took place in 2021. Uh, so the, the Portuguese government will organize a specific uh, social forum for that, and we're all looking very much forward uh, to that. Uh, the future, uh, the link to the future, um, the, the deputy prime minister from Belgium, Mr. van der Broeke, gave a very good speech, um, which in, showed that he had really thought very hard about the future of the, of the social pillar, in particular principle number 12, access to social um, security. And he was calling for a directive. Others uh, in the um, European directive to ensure access to social protection for all, and in particular for the self-employed. Um, others went even further. I think uh, Anna Diamantopoulou um, was bold enough to say we need, we need a treaty change. And she is working on uh, a report. She's the chair of the high-level working group that will report to the commission, I think, sometime uh, early February next year on the future of the welfare state. So that's, again, a lot of uh, uh, material, good material that we can take forward also to the next commission. Um, so today, um, as I said, we have, again, a very full agenda with interventions from academics, businesses, politicians and policymakers. But the format is a bit different than yesterday. We will start, and I'm very much looking forward, with a dedicated panel on the social economy and its very important role in the green transition. Uh, in order to make the discussion as concrete as possible, the session will showcase three examples of green social economy organizations, and uh, they're all here, and their work in the field of the circular economy. Still on the theme of the social economy, I'm very pleased to announce also the social innovation match, which the Commission is launching uh, today, and we will come back to that. Um, it's a great opportunity for such projects, many of which address the green transition in various ways, to also scale up and get added visibility. You will find further information on our website and social media challenge. After the social economy session, uh, we will have first uh, an introductory speech by Commissioner Dali, before we go into the remaining panels, and they will take the form of, as you will have seen on the program, parallel breakout session from which you can really pick and choose and organize your, your morning session here. 
The first trend is on the economic and social developments in Europe, 2022 report, SD, as we call it. SD is an annual uh, paper which the Commission does, in which it invests quite heavily and brings together all the analytical information and the policy recommendations on the topic. And in the spirit of the 2022 European Year of Youth, this re year's report has a particular focus, of course, on the employment and social challenges facing young Europeans, which was, by the way, also a very important topic that came up yesterday. should have mentioned it a bit earlier. The role of young people, without whom the transition will not take place, and they were also here uh, on the platform and contributed um, uh, um, uh, very substantially to yesterday's uh, discussions. So that's the first strand on SD. The second strand concerns a fair and inclusive green and digital transition. The panel will discuss concrete ways forward in order to promote inclusiveness, particularly in the light of last June's Council recommendation on ensuring a fair transition towards climate neutrality. I had the pleasure to be in Sharm El Sheikh for a day and a half last week to, rep to replace the Commissioner, and I can assure you that there also the the fair transition dimension was very, very prominently present and discussed in various um, iterations, not least in the pavilion that the European Commission uh, established uh, together with the ILO. Um, last but not least, uh, the, the third strand will deal with the European care strategy. You'll remember the care strategy was put on the table by the Commission in September this year, quite, quite recent. And that panel will highlight the social and e economic potential of high-quality, person-centered care in the European Union. So that's what is ahead of you today. I wish you a very interesting morning session. And I very much hope that we can make this event uh, into an annual rendezvous um, to address the challenges that we are facing uh, uh, through your active involvement and commitment to the policies that we are shaping. Um, we opted in the forum for a slightly different format than many of the other events that DG Employment organizes every year. Uh, so it's a bit of an experiment for us. So you should also let us know afterwards uh, how, you have, how you perceive this, this new setup and whether you think it is something that we can do uh, every year, which is our firm intention. So thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you so much uh, to Jos Korte, Director General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion for kicking off day uh, two. Um, I've, I've been asked uh, by the organizers to point out that there's a wishing tree, as a matter of fact. A wishing tree has been placed, I think, right by the, the area where you had coffee this morning. This, by the way, everyone joining us online, uh, this also pertains to you, a wishing tree where you can uh, issue and express your wishes, your requests, uh, as far as the employment and social rights issues are concerned. We're collecting those, and then obviously the Director General will gladly have a look at those and and implement many of those requests that uh, you are having, ladies and gentlemen. And now, without uh, further ado, let's kick off the first session. You've already pointed it out, uh, Director General. People and Planet First, unleashing the social economy. We've now, for this session, invited three social enterprises that are focusing on different aspects of the green transition and circular economy. I'm very much looking forward to hear from them. Uh, first up, this is a very, very interesting initiative from France called Les Alchemists. Uh, they are a social enterprise turning food waste into fertilizer. And we're very fortunate to have both their co-founder and CEO as well as the head of innovation with us, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Alex Gilouli and Maiwen Mollet. Thank you so much for the invita invitation. We are very pleased to be here. It's <laughs> okay. Yes. So it's working, but it's it's a bit slow. So um, I'm Alex. This is my win. And uh, so we are very pleased to be here. 
Um, with les, al les alchemists, uh, les alchemists in French, uh, we face, uh, humanity face four big uh, challenges, which is for us soil degradation, climate change, loss of biodiversity, and uh, the question of where the jobs should be created and uh, the question of uh, migration. So this is a very big challenge. Uh, when we, our, our main uh, concern is about the soil, the soil uh, when you know that 40% of the soil are in bad shape. Soil in bad shape, that means 40% of the earth which is beginning to be a desert. So this is a huge uh, challenge and there is not a lot of people speaking about it. So we want to uh, rally uh, a lot of people about uh, this subject. Um, so, okay, <laughs> so uh, wh what, do, um, what do we want to do with that? We th really think that uh, one of the solutions for the climate change and the biodiversity is right under our feet. This is the soil, we can uh, uh, close the loop of the organic matter, uh, taking uh, the bio-waste, uh, composting the bio-waste, and uh, uh, sell the fertilizer. So, um, our, our baseline is ensemble, composté, et nourrir les sols, that means uh, together, uh, com uh, compost and uh, um, enrich the, the soils. Ensemble, uh, together, what does it mean for us? Les, les alchemists is not only our team. Les alchemists uh, is everybody. We should take the question of the soil, the question of uh, the degradation of the soil, uh, uh, very firmly and, and together. So, so together that means our teams, our clients, cities, citizens, European Commission, we will see uh, together uh, after, the farmers, the gardeners, and uh, we, we won't do anything alone. So we need you, and we need you from now. Composté, uh, so com compost the food waste is a, a very simple thing. Uh, the nature uh, didn't wait for humans to, uh, to, to compost the, 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 the bio waste. Uh, we just have to adapt uh, what the nature do, uh, does uh, in, um, in uh, our uh, big cities because uh, it's much more difficult to uh, collect, compost, and uh, uh, um, give back the organic matter to the soil when you, are, when you are in a city where there is a lot of food waste and very, uh, very few uh, uh, gardens. So we just want to copy the nature. We just let the bacteria and so on work properly in the best condition. Okay. And, and last, but maybe it's our main mission, it's uh, creating jobs in this field and nourrir les sols, which that means uh, fertilize our soils. So we have, uh, uh, our compost is, uh, is sold uh, in uh, more than 1,300 uh, point uh, selling points in France. We sell a lot of compost to the to the agriculture, the, the gardeners, the, the cities, because we know with uh, the uh, climate change that the cities should uh, make a, um, uh, put a lot of uh, green and trees in the city if we want to, to, to be able to, to live in, in these cities. So this is what, what, we, this is what we do. Um, and what is important to us is uh, we can uh, uh, take these challenges, create jobs in France or in Belgium, but, uh, and um, make uh, these territories much more resilient than they are now. So now we are uh, depending from the, the fertilizer from uh, Russia, from uh, a lot of 
uh, a lot of place in the world, and we know that it's very dangerous to depend on, uh, on, a, on a lot of people outside. <laughs> we also wanted to show you a typical example of what we do with our client. This client is not typical because it's uh, the Prime Minister house in, uh, in uh, Paris. Um, what do we do with them? Uh, they do the sorting in the kitchen of the Prime Minister house. Uh, we come and collect the food waste. We compost it less than 10 kilometers from, uh, from, the, from the, their, their place. And then, actually, the compost is used by the gardeners of Matignon, Prime Minister House, to plant trees. So this is the kind of very local loop that we, that we love. Another uh, funny story about this composting uh, platform is that um, it is located very near from a, um, a flower uh, farm. Uh, that grow uh, flowers, and uh, so they use our compost, of course, because we're very nearby. And actually, these flowers will be uh, very likely used for the bouquets of uh, the French Olympics uh, in uh, 2024. So instead of buying flowers maybe in the Netherlands or, or so. So it shows that with local waste, we can do wonderful things. Another loop, a very innovative one that we are working on, is uh, that we compost baby diapers, baby used uh, diapers. Um, we work with manufacturers uh, that have conceived specific diapers. It, uh, for those who have children here, it's not already on the market. <laughs> and so they have conceived uh, prototypes, fully compostable diapers. Um, some childcare centers in Paris use them, for example, uh, Paris municipality. Then uh, the alchemists, we come and collect the, the used diapers, we compost it, and uh, for the end of uh, life, it is actually the, the school, the gardening school that trains the um, uh, Paris staff uh, that uh, is actually now testing the compost made from uh, diapers. For, for those who were here yesterday, one of the key takeouts was that uh, things are changing, but not fast enough. At Les Alchemists, we go quite fast, not growth for, the, for growth sake, but just growth because we think that we should uh, switch to uh, another uh, model instead of incinerating or uh, sending to landfill uh, uh, food waste. We often say that soil is our only limit, by 2030, uh, we should uh, multiply by seven our number of employees. We, will, we should compost uh, millions of uh, compostable diapers and uh, millions of tons of uh, food waste. Uh, and we often say that we want to rally seven million uh, people. Uh, when we say that, it means uh, people that uh, know the essentials about soils, that uh, do the sorting at home in order that their, their food waste is composted, and people that talk about it around them. And we think it is the only, only way we can make this uh, transition. So what can we do? I think that in this room, we all can do something at a personal uh, scale, uh, city, community, regional, national, and of course, Europe. Uh, actually, Europe has played a big role in uh, our sector because with the 2018 directive on bio-waste, uh, Europe has asked countries uh, to prepare uh, for 2024 so that every citizen has um, a solution to, uh, to compost its uh, food waste. So it's very good because now the law is here, now we just need to enforce the law. Fortunately, in France, we are quite uh, late. Uh, I think that most cities are not ready yet, it's in uh, one year now. So if there are some French people here, just ask your, your municipality what their plan for, to, for 2024. And also we have hope with Europe, um, with the soil strategy. Uh, soil strategy is now available and we think that is going in a good direction. There should be a soil S law for next year. And we really hope that this uh, law will be uh, very ambitious that uh, it will make uh, organic matter rate the new KPI for everyone. 
and also that it will help farmers to do the transition from a mineral fertilizer made with gas from Russia to organic fertilizer like compost, for example, because they need help. And also, we think that someday Europe will allow human matter uh, in uh, fertilizers because they actually we have to take the nutrients where they are, and they are in our food waste, and they are in our urine and fecal matters. So they are here, they are available, they are almost free. <laughs> so let's let's take it uh, and and switch to a new uh, to a new model. Thank you. Thanks. Indeed, <laughs> thank you so much to Alex and my Wen from Les Alchemists. Thank you so much for this initiative, the social enterprise turning food waste into fertilizer. Thank you so much. We'll come back to you in just a moment. Again, we will have a panel discussion with all three presenters in just a moment. So for those here in uh, the audience, but also joining us online, feel free to submit questions uh, to them and we'll squeeze them in time uh, permitting. Now we're moving from France to Romania and an organization called Atelier Fara Frontier, which is uh, Actually, which is a great social um, enterprise with a focus on different aspects of the green transition and circular economy. We have with us the development director of Atelier Fara Frontier with us, and she will tell us what the organization is all about and what it does. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lorita Constantinescu. Hello everyone, good morning. Thank you for the invitation, thank you for the Commission for inviting us, thank you uh, to the European Network for Social Enterprises for Work Integration, our colleagues, we are members of this 40 Social Enterprising European Network and we are working together at the European level and I'm here because they also provide us the invitation. I will start my presentation of the organization with, um, with an introduction because we are switching from the uh, biodegradable waste to electronic and electric waste. But before that, when we look at the uh, waste that we are generating, we also should look not only to the recy recycling, but also to the reuse. So reuse is also generating jobs. And when we look at this figure from Reuse, Reuse is another international network for social enterprises dealing with um, reusing waste. We look that electric and electronic waste create even more jobs than reusing other types of waste, like textiles that hopefully will increase, in Europe soon, together with the uh, directive that we are all waiting for. And we also looking that electric and electronic use is much more creating jobs for other type of, uh, of waste. So at the level of Europe, for those who are in these fields, they know the figures, that if we reuse 1% of our waste, we can create 200,000 jobs, which, when you look at the jobs, the jobs uh, that are in the industry of reusing waste are jobs particular suitable for people who are vulnerable, because they are repetitive, quite simple, and we can create more jobs for them because they are low-skilled. So this is the way that we are thinking at, in Romania, in our organization, hopefully our uh, principles and words will be spread, but also there are many other initiatives in Europe. And now, about Ateliere Fara Frontiere, workshop without borders. We are an organization that was set up 14 years ago, and our main mission is the social one. We want to create more jobs, for um, vulnerable people, and plus we want to integrate them into the society because they deal with many social, educational, health challenges. We are working with people that are coming from domestic violence, from school dropout, from 
uh, people with disabilities, people deprived um, of uh, liberty, people coming out of prison, people that are in treatment of abuse of some substances, drugs and alcohols. But for whatever reason that happens in, in their lives, they deserve a second chance, and this is what we do. And how we do that? Actually, we are hire them, we create green jobs in our workshops, we hire them, and while they work, they have an experience learning process. They go through a program that is designed for 24 months, and it's a personalized program. We adapt the program from, for each of them, because each of them, they have their own challenges, and we should fulfill their challenges. So there is a social program to fulfill their needs, but also to get them the basic transversal skills for a work environment. So we have this program that goes for 24 months, and then if they need, they can stay another year. And at the end of this program, we help them to get a job on the conventional labor market. So you have here all the phases that they, they go through. Some of them, they finish the program earlier. Some of them, they can finish the program later. And now about the workshops, where we hire them. We have three workshops. We invented another one this year. Um, but these are the uh, main three uh, workshops that we, we do. And they, all of them are about environment. Social is first, environment is second. Sometimes, we don't know, sometimes colleagues, they said, environment is first, or social cannot go without environment. And you will see why environment is everywhere. EduClick. EduClick, it's about collecting, reusing, and make the first time, uh, first step for recycling. We collect electric and electronic waste. We are an authorized collector, as anyone on the market. But what we do different, we refurbish the computers. And we donate the computers to the schools from deprived communities in the low development areas to get them into the uh, IT lab to increase the digital education in Romania, particularly in the rural area. All the work is done by the vulnerable people. Oh, if I want to go back. No. So we collect about 200 tons of electric and electronic waste, and 30% is reused. Here are some data about the computers that we donate to schools. We reached this year 25,000 computers, donate, reused computers, donated to schools to approximately 10% of the schools in Romania. The second workshop is called Rimesh. Rimesh is about reusing the outdoor advertising materials that they don't have a recycling solution, unfortunately. We didn't find one in Romania, we didn't find one in Europe. If there is one, we need some help. And the only chance to uh, decrease the impact of those uh, waste banners is to reuse them. So actually, we built a sewing workshop where our colleagues, they learn how to sew, they learn how to to, to manage with uh, this waste. And the third workshop is in the agriculture. So we have various industries where we work, which makes the activity uh, complex. We set up a farm, a social farm, in a very small village close to Bucharest, the capital city, where there is a community of vulnerable people. In comparing with the uh, other two workshops that they are based in Bucharest, in the city, here we hire the people and they stay with us as much as they want because they don't want to leave their community. 
If someone wants to leave the community to go to work in Bucharest or in other place, we help them. But normally, most of them are women, they have kids, and they don't want to leave uh, the village. So there is a farm. We have five hectares of farm. The agriculture that we practice is organic agriculture, and we sell vegetables directly to consumer based on registration. The impact of, on environment is very low because we have greenhouses without heating system. We, uh, the, our clients, they eat seasonal vegetables, which sometimes is quite difficult, but this is it if we want to, to be green. And uh, we have this system of delivery also that uh, with the uh, point of delivery that it's uh, having a lower impact on environment because we don't spread uh, the, we tra don't transport the vegetables to each of our clients. And lately this year, because of the crisis, we got involved in the second phases, as you probably all know, we, have a, we, had a lot, we are at the border with Ukraine and we had a lot of people coming from, from Ukraine. And we got involved in the second stage um, of the crisis where people decided to stay in Romania and they needed jobs. So we started hire colleagues from uh, Ukraine in our workshops, vulnerable people, and we also help others to get a job on the conventional market. At the social impact, we hire up to now about 300 vulnerable people since the beginning. It might look low, but to work with vulnerable people, it's very difficult. Improving their life, working time, you know, every day, every hour with them, trying to improve their lives is not very easy. So we are proud of our, our work, and we also um, deal with difficult cases. This is why maybe it looks low, maybe it looks high. Our success rate of integration into the labor market is up to 60%. Oops. Thank you. If I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you, thank you, Lorita, for highlighting the work of Atelier Fara Frontier. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, last but uh, certainly not least, our third uh, initiative, our third presenter, our third enterprise is coming from Austria, named Baucarousel, a provider for social urban mining. Ladies and gentlemen, what is it all about? We'll find out now from Sonja Zumpfe. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here to give you a, a point of view uh, what power carousel means. We talked about waste in all kinds, uh, and this is a very big waste we have to deal with. You know, power carousel means, um, means construction carousel. Um, and is uh, based in Vienna. And since, since 2016, uh, we are specialized in social urban mining because we, um, we, uh, it's, we thought it's a perfect match to uh, give an ecological and a social impact uh, together. Um, I'm so sorry, it doesn't work. Or, ah, it's, this is. Okay, and there is a lot to do. <laughs> uh, in Vienna alone, we have about 400 de deconstructed large volume buildings, and when I say large volume, it's really large. And uh, in Austria, every year, there is uh, a construction waste, uh, about 11 million tons. This is very much this uh, waste uh, we want to uh, to uh, get valuable because it has very high values and um, therefore, uh, yes, this is also an important thing because 90% of this material comes from deconstruction, refurbishment and um, 
only 10% are from uh, come from new buildings constructions. So it's not the construction site which is the problem. It's also a problem, but the big problem is uh, when you really have to demolish a, a building. What to do with the material? Nowadays, uh, uh, it, uh, we we um, uh, we make it uh, since 2016. At this time, urban mining itself was not such an item, yeah, because it's. Uh, there were thoughts of the costs and other processes which doesn't exi which didn't exist. Um, so, so, so social urban mining was uh, uh, no item at all, but it became more important now because of the EU taxonomy, the regulatories force governments and also companies to um, to uh, um, think about their own circular economies. We have to come from a linear to a circular in the whole uh, building sector. And uh, also, this is on the one hand the regulatories, but on the other hand, uh, we all we, we felt it now uh, in, in, in the last uh, year, year, months, yeah, that our resources are less available, especially these materials. And uh, it, it's, it's like metals, woods, uh, um, stones, or something like that. And uh, the supply chains are sensitively disturbed. So uh, the people feel now, it's like the climate, they feel now that we have to do something and to save uh, material that we have on our local um, um, stations. <laughs> Sorry about my English. <laughs> so. Um, so coming from a, a linear to a circular um, economy means in the building sector, uh, I think it's the same in your, in your uh, uh, area, um, it means uh, we have to build a completely new labor market. There are no skills uh, to, uh, to deal with the processes we need because it's another thing to, to throw it away. Uh, but to plan with secondary material for the architects and uh, to, to save it, to store it, it's a really, uh, to renew it for reusing uh, or uh, high up recycling, for example. Then need, uh, there, uh, we have to need uh, quite different processes which uh, doesn't exist yet. Um, so, we also wanted to um, combine it with a high social impact. And these two uh, um, things match so, so good together because uh, there are no skills uh, um, in the market, in the, in the, in the, in the labor market. So, um, wait a minute. So we wanted to bring social and ecological impact together um, and try to recover uh, the, the manpower with the um, uh, proceed of sale from the material. And um, yeah, and we, we have for these local operational partners, it's very important to, to have them regional uh, so that the uh, people don't have to travel very far. Um, they hire um, long employed people and those who have technical or mechatronic uh, skills um, work on our um, construction sites in our projects and um, under the instruction of these uh, partners uh, that, we, that we have. It depends where the construction site is. We, we are looking for, for a social partner who hires uh, these people. So they will be trained on the job. They learn how to remove it. You see, they deal with all kinds of, of, uh, of material. So how uh, are the steps? We first uh, go to, um, um, to assume the potential which is inside the, the building. Uh, it's, this is very important for calculating the, the whole project. 
Uh, uh, and then uh, we, uh, when we get the project from the building owner, we uh, um, uh, work very closely with him because the timetable must fit the, the processes. We have to be integrated in the whole uh, um, uh, building process then. And yes, this is, I think, yeah, this, this is also a point uh, for the, for the um, building owner. Is, is, it is a, a very good process for awareness because we show him uh, uh, the values in, in the building that he, uh, without Baukarussell, would, uh, waste, uh, would thro throw away. <laughs> so we are the first uh, startup in, in the building sector um, for social urban mining. There is uh, no one more. And uh, this is also a, a very a good chance now. So we see the demand and, and will ex ex Pend. Uh, we want to. Um, uh, we we make a cooperative now with uh, all the players in the in the uh, circular economy of buildings. So here you can see the uh, the people at work. They deal with uh, parquet, with floors, with lamps. Uh, with all kinds of stuff, it's very important uh, for high-quality recycling and reusing that they really separate several fractions because metal, like aluminium or copper, uh, is very um, high-priced and the other things we uh, try to sell on our uh, online catalog. Here you can see it. Uh, there are uh, huge uh, projects done, and uh, we also have uh, very old buildings in, in, in Vienna, like here in Brussels, and there are very uh, interesting things also to, uh, to mine, like elevator caps or something like that. So here you also can see a higher pr uh, upcycling uh, from the doors of uh, where the new uh, medical university in Vienna uh, is building, uh, will build now. Uh, an architect uh, upcycled it to uh, um, 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 wall paneling. So it's also, uh, a, a, it can be also a very design, uh, a design fact, um, yes. So, yes, um, to, uh, to make it short, because I was told to <laughs> make it a little bit shorter. Um, so, social urban mining makes waste visible, it becomes valuable, this is the one side. It conserves, conserves our resources and reduces energy demand, creates social economy, it links together and it fits very good together. It needs uh, for that local social economy partners for the operational work. And the work is co-financed from the proceed. This is also a very important fact for the building owners that uh, it doesn't uh, uh, have uh, much more costs. So, wait a minute. The only, only uh, sorry, I forgot this. Uh, um, have uh, only to, to give you a, 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 the result. Uh, since 2016, we extended lifetimes of components about uh, 1,030, uh, uh, 333 material, uh, created 29,000 hours working hours, and uh, the second life projects uh, were about 583 tons. And there is much more to do. This, is, this were only uh, pilot projects. So these are our uh, social partners we deal with. And yeah, I thank you very much. I hope I wasn't so too long now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, Sonja Zumpfer. Thank you to everyone else uh, for their presentation. Certainly very admirable, very important initiatives that you have uh, put uh, forth. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, you, you are all a shining example of uh, putting people and the planet first and unleashing the social economy. Obviously, a subject matter that is also very important to the Commission as such. They have issued a report titled Building an Economy that Works for People and Action Plan 
for the social economy. So I'm sure get this report either uh, in, in, in paper or uh, online. S sadly, time is an issue today because we are uh, a marathon session. So let me just quickly uh, ask both uh, all of you uh, one question, Alex and Mai Wen. Even if you're not from France, um, there are many people here from all across Europe, how can people support your initiative? <laughs> it's a, um, <coughs> we uh, we we really try to be to rally a lot of people about uh, the soil question and the and the, the job creation that you can make uh, with uh, this activity. So it's not only us. Um, uh, our message is not uh, is, is uh, uh, it's not to help uh, les alchemists as a, an enterprise or a company. It's to rally the movement and to sort on your house. To, uh, to sort the bio waste on your house, composting if you have a garden, and if there is a collection uh, system in your, in your cities, that to, to, to make it happen as, uh, as fast as possible. Because uh, as uh, my wind told uh, before, in France, we are quite late uh, on this subject. Only 6% of the population uh, can uh, has a collection uh, uh, service. So, for French people and other European people, just ask your uh, uh, policymaker, ask your municipality to, to do and to make it happen very fast because we cannot happen uh, anymore. And are, are you cooperating with other European partners to bring that idea into other European countries? Yes, we, we, we have some collaboration with uh, other, uh, other organizations in Europe, but as a matter of fact, in France, so uh, w w as we are late, <laughs> we, are, we, 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 we just <laughs> we are even later. <laughs> we, 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 we just want <laughs> to, is, we to, to, yeah. to 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 go to go faster. So, uh, yeah, there is a, a lot of organization about uh, this uh, subject in Europe, and uh, we want to push up uh, this subject with a European directive on the soils. And what we want to to say today that it's not just uh, just for the environment and soil, but it's a lot of jobs that can be created uh, in the in the next years if we sort, if we valorize our our waste. Loretta, being late is very relative. I heard you say we're even later, uh, yeah. but but uh, again, the question also to you: uh, How can people? all across Europe, the European continent, support your initiative? When we are looking at the waste, we think that there are particular flows of waste, as the electric and electronic waste, that can be reused. So the idea is that people, companies, organizations so should work with social enterprises or organizations that they have this model to help reuse the electric and electronic wa waste in these enterprises because this is how they also help vulnerable people. There are a lot of people, as I said in my presentation, that for whatever reason, their life was not uh, a happy one. They didn't have a chance. And with the reusing waste, they can get uh, a chance to have a proper job because, as I said, the, uh, the work that they do, they should start with very simple things. In our workshops, we have an evolution of the job. You start from simple things and you go to more complicated things. As in a normal uh, setup, so reuse the waste, uh, try to find solutions for, for other types of waste, as I said, we are later in, uh, in composting, very, very late. Actually, we don't do uh, it. There are only two or three initiatives in the, in the country. And uh, there are also other ways that they are waiting to, uh, to be reused. We don't do too much on uh, construction waste. Uh, we don't do too much on the textile waste. So there are so many opportunities over there that it's also for the environment, but it's also for the vulnerable people. Zonia, to, to, just lastly, to wrap up the session, uh, this is an idea obviously born out of and in Austria. Uh, is this going to uh, 
go beyond uh, the Austrian uh, <laughs> boundaries? We hope so. We hope so. But uh, the first step is to uh, integrate it in Austria and to to uh, build the processes and standards with the. Is the government on board? Uh, we um, <laughs> we we are working on it. <laughs> <laughs> It, uh, how about the Romanian government? Uh, are they in tune with what you're doing? Yes, they are. On the electric and electronic waste, it's a flow that is uh, uh, regulated very well in, in Romania. We need to increase, we need to fulfill the objectives set up at the European level. With the social uh, integration, uh, work integration, we are working on it. <laughs> well, I think we're working on it. Whether you are late or later, I think the timing uh, it cannot be put into quantity. I think the idea is the right one, is the correct one, and therefore you are here on stage uh, at this uh, forum as shining examples uh, of uh, three very successful and promising uh, circular economy enterprises. Thank you so much, Alex, Maiven, Lorita, Zonia. This is your applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is now the part uh, where we are all going into our three back-to-back -back marathon uh, sessions. And uh, to do an intro uh, about that, we're going to have a look. Uh, the European Commissioner for Equality, Helena Dali, has sent us a video message. Let's see what she has to say. Dear participants, the European Commission is committed to equality for all, in all of its senses. Indeed, the building of fair, inclusive and equal societies is a central feature of the European pillar of social rights action plan. A diverse workforce is good for business. Managed well, it improves staff motivation, trust and performance and the quality of decision making. When everyone can be themselves at work, companies perform better and contribute to economic growth. Organizations can commit to diversity and inclusion in the workplace through national diversity charters. Thousands of both private and public organizations, as well as NGOs and trade unions, have already signed up across virtually all member states. And through the EU platform of diversity charters, they come together and exchange best practices on designing and implementing effective diversity and inclusion policies. Our goal is to reach an inclusive employment rate of 78% by 2030. It means Europe must at least halve the gender employment gap compared to 2019. The Commission put forward several legal and other measures to enhance women's participation in the labour market. However, there can be no true professional diversity without gender equality in corporate leadership. Across the European Union, women still face barriers to reach the top. A recent landmark agreement was reached by the co-legislators on the Commission's proposal for a directive on improving the gender balance among non-executive directors of listed companies. It will make the selection of members transparent and based on merit and qualification. It sets a share of 40% of the underrepresented sex among non-executive directors and 33% among all directors. This will no doubt benefit the creativity and productivity of companies. At the Commission, the share of women in management positions is at 46%. The Commission is among the very few public administrations around the world which almost an equal share of women in leadership. We are aiming for full gender equality at all levels of Commission management by 2024 and our human resource services are developing a strategy to building a diverse and inclusive workplace where everyone belongs, is valued and has the same opportunities to thrive. I encourage you to revisit your own HR strategies in this sense. The European economy must make the best use of all its talents and everyone must have a fair opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, wel welcome back. Um, I hope you all had uh, fruitful discussions in the breakout uh, uh, sessions. We certainly did here three back to back, same for you. And I'm sure all the inputs, uh, will, all the content will be collected 
by the organizers and then um, convey to you in some shape uh, or form. But uh, I can only speak about the sessions that I had the pleasure of moderating here in this room. They were quite vibrant and uh, produced a lot of uh, content. After two very full uh, days uh, packed agenda, we're now actually coming to the end of the European Employment and Social Rights uh, Forum. So for the closing speech now, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, here to the stage the Deputy Director General of the Employment, Social and Affairs and Inclusion uh, Division at the European Commission. Great to have you here, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Andriana Sukova. That was a lot of applause, even before I speak. Oh, it's of strange, course, yeah? of course. <laughs> that was a lot of applause even before I started speaking, so I cannot expect the end. Uh, thank you very much. Well. First, I would like to say that I'm absolutely honored to have the possibility to close the first flagship event that we are organizing in uh, relation to our European employment and social rights. And this is really, uh, this has been two days, almost two days, of very rich exchanges, of very dynamic discussions on what are the right ways, are we identifying our challenges well, are we identifying our tools to address the challenge as well? And um, I think that uh, my director general this morning tried to sum up the discussions yesterday. So I'm not going back to the overall event uh, conclusions, more or less. But I would like to uh, first inform everyone who was, not, uh, uh, who was split in different uh, thematic discussions uh, this morning about what were the key issues that were discussed and key conclusions that were drawn. Now, uh, we started first uh, today with the social uh, economy, and uh, I want to thank for uh, the three presented projects and the managers of these projects for their inspiration, for their innovation and creativity in identifying very positive both social and green outcomes of their work. And I think this is the way ahead. We are trying to keep intact and very closely linked both the digital and uh, green transition to the social element of it. We, you know that uh, we have launched the social innovation match so that uh, this is our new EU-wide database which will enable interesting stakeholders to showcase their social innovation projects and search for partners and initiatives developed in their countries. And today we started this uh, in a very positive way with the three presentations. At EU level, the Commission adopted the Social Economy Action Plan almost one year ago in December 2021. And uh, we have a clear commitment to work for a European social economy that strives, that thrives and that's stepping into the economic and job creation potential and also tapping on the potential of every individual in the European Union. Our aim is to have a fair and inclusive recovery of our economies after all the crises that we've lived through and social economy can be a very important part of this process. We are proposing next year through a council recommendation to member states how to pursue better conditions for social economy organizations for Europe. And uh, we hope that uh, those that are interested in, interested in the social economy will also be an important player in our exchanges on the best legal and policy framework that needs to be in place in, in the countries so that social economy can uh, have a good basis for development. Now I'll come to the three sessions, breakout sessions, and we discovered that uh, we had a very well aligned logic of the topics, addressing them from different aspects, which is quite good, but time was not enough. There was no possibility for the people that were not on the stage to come in, to ask questions, to elaborate on their ideas, and I think this is one of the major lessons learned for next year. I'll start with uh, some uh, short overviews and conclusions that, uh, with the help of my colleagues, I really appreciate all of them, uh, have drawn and taken notes of uh, what were the key discussions in the three parallel workshops. 
I'll start with the one on uh, employment and the employment and social development report discussion. This is one of our key deliverable every year where we're providing a very deep analysis on what are the changes, what are the trends in Europe, and what are the main policy uh, actions that uh, accompany these uh, trends. So uh, there were three sessions discussing the European social, uh, European social employment and social development in Europe report. And uh, the first session stressed that employment rates have reached pre-pandemic levels, which is quite okay. Uh, but uh, cost of living are going high. Young persons are experiencing such situations for the first time. And there are symptoms of anxiety and depression which are going up. About 30 to 80% of young people report on such anxieties and uh, depression in an OECD report. And this is something that is really worrying. We need to pay attention to our young people. We need to go through whatever we can to accompany their transition from education to jobs, giving them the perspective, but also giving them the right accompanying hand. There has been also a trade union perspective expressed at this uh, web, uh, seminar, the, where uh, it was stressed that there is a need to learn from previous crises, where we saw young people disproportionately in non-standard forms of employment, and that uh, this also affected the well-being of young, young people, but also their perspectives for life. The participants stressed that aging societies need young persons in the labor market, especially in the context of key labor market and skills shortages. And I think that we cannot talk enough skills. We'll never be able to cover all the elements of what are the skills needs, how these skills should be provided for on a timely manner. In the context of the crisis, certain labor markets and skill shortages will remain in parallel. And uh, discussing on effective policies, there were some highlights on the possibilities for young people to work in diverse force forms of employment. And this uh, we are doing a lot with the uh, Alliance for Apprenticeships, with providing the traineeships and uh, providing we have one new initiative, which is called ALMA, addressing the in disadvantaged young people, getting them first on a social inclusion path, but also on a uh, labor market uh, inclusion path. Uh, the second session in this discussion of the Employment and Social Development of Europe report, there was a stress on the impact of recessions on labor market outcomes of young people, and uh, there are short recessions that impact more uh, than long and mild ones. The pandemic disrupted the educational path of young people and we all know that it is very important that young people build on their knowledge gradually, so uh, there will be inevitably be an impact of the COVID pandemic on the educational achievements of young people. The large impact on the mental health and well-being of young workers were also highlighted and the importance of apprenticeships and internships for young people to get the foot into the labor market was underlined in particular in that uh, second discussion of the panel. And the third session for uh, the Re Employment and Social Development Report, uh, there was an underlining uh, message that uh, sharply increasing prices amidst the energy crisis uh, and uncertainty which is posed of uh, the COVID follow-ups pose a huge challenge to social outcomes for everyone. Gender gaps were highlighted as well, and this cannot be explained by individual characteristics always. And within the survey uh, asked to the audience, the housing affordability was perceived as the most pressing challenge to young people, also in their living conditions in post-recovery times. So we are taking a lot of key concerns and messages from uh, the discussions on which we will be working further on and also trying to figure out how they can be part of our policy developments in the next years. The, the second parallel workshop was in this room. It was about fair, green and digital transitions. And uh, I am very happy of the discussion because I attended this one uh, parallel workshop 
we concluded that the way we live and we have lived our lives had reached its limits. We have now the challenge to fully embed the social dimension into all our policies and make sure that no one is left behind. I think that this is a slogan of all our work. The transition does, only, does not only concern some groups. The transition is for all. And uh, of course, there are differences in how we are impacted by these transitions and the consequences of the transitions, but everyone is part of it and we have to jointly try to overcome the challenge of these transitions. Most importantly, we have to make it a success. It is also important to adopt a horizontal approach and now is the time to embed social aspects fully in climate policies. This is what we are doing now in uh, discussions of the European Green Deal package and my colleagues, some of them are here in the room, they are really uh, very strongly involved in making sure that indeed social aspects are addressed in any green uh, and climate uh, policy. We also need to integrate all groups, including women and the most disadvantaged, as well as social and environmental organizations and partners in our policy design and policy formulation. And I think that this partic participatory approach is key, not only in relation to the twin green and digital transition, but also in relation to uh, the next um, thematic discussion that we had on the care strategy. I would like shortly to continue on this uh, parallel uh, workshop on the green and digital and fair transition. Uh, we have to consider the specificities of each group that is affected by uh, the transition and ensure that uh, we are tackling division of labor, skilling of women from early education and so on to prepare everyone for uh, embracing the European Green Deal and also contributing to changing our society and way of living and working. Energy poverty is a multi and poverty in general was mentioned as a multidimensional issue and we need to understand the different drivers of poverty and address the structural barriers to eradicating poverty. So we need to work with a very clear mind that a lot of actions are needed to address poor people but also a lot of accompanying measures can help them overcome the situation and let me remind again that uh, we have a target at EU level by 2030 to reduce by 15 million the number of people that are in poverty, including at least 5 million within these 15 million to be children. And this is something that's uh, really in the core of uh, the work of our social policy. Uh, we, when we discussed the synergies between the green and digital transitions, uh, we identified that uh, the digital transition very often is seen as a driver of divergence rather than convergence. So there is a risk that we also get the same perception or the, came the same risk for the green transition. And to avoid this, policies, regulations and support to skills are the key. We need to ensure measures for up and reskilling, vocational education and training, and in general policies to ensure that the transition is working towards this objective. We should not overlook the challenges and barriers to innovation digital technologies and adopting a human-centric approach which is the right pathway to alleviate these challenges. We need synergies between green and digital jobs because they both require more skilled people and that digital and green jobs are not equally distributed at national level so uh, there will be always some differences of uh, progress against the green objectives and against the digitalization of our economy and life. So uh, we should make all our efforts to make sure that these processes go in the right direction, but also that we reduce the footprint of internet and digital uh, actions, because this was signaled as one of the challenges uh, which we don't uh, often recollect. In relation to the fair digital transition and digital rights and principles, the last session here, in the new world of work, there are opportunities and risks from digitalization, including artificial intelligence, algorithmic management, and these were mentioned by the speakers. And there are many opportunities, including in relation to working conditions, to health and safety, 
and policy and worker involvement are key again to address these uh, challenges. There is a need for regulatory intervention, transparency in our communication, and I think that I can conclude generally that we need worker stakeholder involvement throughout the whole process or the entire process of our work. The third set of workshops uh, were discussing the European care strategy and uh, care is relevant for all of us. That's out of question. We all need care at some point of our lives and um, also we do provide care to our loved ones, our families. So uh, there are clear, just mentioned this morning the care strategy that was adopted, we have identified a clear reality of labor shortages in the care sector in Europe, in all member states. And uh, the experts of the panel agreed that, Andre, uh, in, that only increased public investment combined with strong social dialogue and better training opportunities can improve the conditions of care workers and enhance, enhance the attractiveness of, this, uh, of care jobs. The care strategy set an agenda to not only improve the situation of care receivers, but also of caregivers. And uh, it calls for improving working conditions of care workers and providing work-life balance for family carers. The second part of the workshop addressed the equal access to quality care services. And uh, the conclusions are, or discussions were around the need of many people for long-term care and uh, some of them are not able to have access to such care because the care services are not affordable, available or accessible. So in rural and remote areas and regions with low population density, this is particularly sharp and uh, there is a clear lack of uh, available care services in those regions. Increasing the availability of care services needs to go hand in hand with improving their quality, affordability and accessibility, but improving the affordability of care services leads to fairer access to care. So everything is intertwined and uh, one action will never be enough. We have to think about all the aspects of care receivers, caregivers, working conditions, and also uh, go for a comprehensive solution uh, that uh, covers all involved in this uh, sector. And the third part of the discussion was focusing on people in the center. So the high quality and affordable long-term care empowers people to live in dignity and maintain their autonomy. The quality of long-term care is a measure of our society's abilities to uphold people's fundamental rights and the principles set out in the European Pillar of Social Rights. So what we can advise member states to do in this area and uh, we have done this in the strategy. First, they, want, they need to establish high quality standards for all long-term care settings tailored to their characteristics and specificities. Second, they have to apply them to all long-term care providers irrespective of their legal status. And we also have a solution how this could be done. Through a quality framework for long-term care, which ensures a common understanding of quality and a consistent approach to all uh, for long-term care providers, accompanied by adequate quality assurance mechanisms and working in partnership with experts, academia, stakeholders and practitioners. And uh, without talking a bit too much, I would like to just say that all these discussions and actions on the policy side are strongly supported by the European Social Fund Plus implementation in the next programming period of 21-27. And this first, I can say that the European Social Fund is one of the demonstrations of European solidarity, trying to help people get better uh, labor opportunities, get better access to education, get better access to social services, and also uh, we will continue allowing for a focused investments through the SF Plus in all member states programs to achieve the green and digital transition, focusing on the skills needed for these transitions, because we will never achieve our objectives if we don't have the skilled people to deliver on that. We will continue working with all of you, I hope, researchers, stakeholders, civil society organizations, social partners, and so on, uh, 
to invest in our green and digital transition with the concern that no one is left behind, that everybody's concerns, challenges are in a way addressed and supported. And we have to uh, take our lessons from the discussions of the last two days in our policy work. So on behalf of the entire Directorate General for Employment and Social Rights, I want to thank everyone who has contributed to this event. I think uh, there were a number of participants online, which is amazing. And even yesterday morning, I was receiving questions whether people can still log on. So it means that uh, we've managed to draw the attention to a very important policy work, which uh, is well-shaped, well-framed, and I hope will bring all the results that we are looking for. I want to express very special thanks to all the colleagues from the Unit A2, uh, Mina especially, because this event is a very complex one, but they prove that nothing is impossible. And uh, I'm authorized by my Director General to express formally and to officially our gratitude and uh, our great appreciation of everything that you've done, Mina. So I want to... I want to thank also the uh, people who made or facilitated the discussions and uh, um, all the exchanges in the last two days because uh, very skillfully managing different ideas, people coming with different backgrounds and uh, proposals in a structured discussion. And uh, I'm really looking forward for the next year's edition of our employment, European Employment and Social Rights Forum where we can take stock of the progress, but also come with probably some solutions. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's not that. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much indeed to Andriana Sukova, the Deputy Director General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion at the European Commission. Now, uh, it's, it's been wonderful. It's been a great pleasure for me to guide you throughout the last two days. We're actually now at the final point after having listened to the closing speech. The only uh, last piece of information that I want to convey to you is that from 2.30 to 3.30, there's going to be a communication workshop uh, meeting in the room aquarium for everyone who have registered for that, and with that, uh, thanks to everyone for their participation, their input. This concludes uh, the inaugural European Employment and Social Rights uh, Forum. Uh, hope to have you all back next year. Until then, be safe and keep up the good work. Thank you so much.